In the stoichiometry lab, you are going to react vinegar and baking soda to determine the mass of carbon dioxide that you're going to form. So, you are not making a volcano. Okay, if you do make a volcano, you're going to clean up the mess. What you're going to do is you're going to get yourself some baking soda. Which is, has a chemical formula of NaHCO3 and a dilute solution of acetic acid, which is vinegar, and you're going to form carbon dioxide, water, and sodium acetate. So this is your baking soda here, which has a chemical formula of sodium hy uh, hydrogen carbonate, or sodium bicarbonate. And this is a dilute solution of acetic acid, which is what we call vinegar. Now the water that you form is going to be a liquid, and the sodium acetate is going to be dissolved in the water. So those will stay in your beaker for you. But the carbon dioxide is a gas. Now that's not going to sit all nice and neat in your beaker for you. Since the beaker is open, that's going to float out into the air. But because of the law of conservation of mass, we can determine how much baking soda we make. Because the law of conservation of mass tells us that the mass of our reactants should equal the mass of our products. So if we know the total mass of our reactants and we know the mass of our remaining products, we can figure out the mass of the product that escaped into the air. So you're going to need yourself about one gram of baking soda, and it doesn't need to be exactly one gram, just roughly about one gram, and you're going to get yourself 30 milliliters of beaker, and you're going to record the mass of your vinegar. So you're going to slowly add your baking soda to the vinegar until the solution is clear, until you don't have any undissolved baking soda. You're going to do this three times because we want to show that our results are reproducible. So it walks you through on your report sheet in the data table how to get the mass of just your vinegar, how to get the total mass of your reactants, how to get the mass of your products, and how to get the mass of your carbon dioxide. So it walks you through all of that. What we need to talk about is how to calculate your moles of baking soda, your theoretical yield of carbon dioxide, and your theoretical yield of carbon dioxide in grams, and then your percent yield. So to get the moles of baking soda that you use, what you're going to do is you're going to take the mass of your sodium bicarbonate, which is your baking soda, and you'll need to calculate the molar mass of sodium bicarbonate. So once you do that, you're going to plug in your mass of sodium bicarbonate per one mole of sodium bicarbonate. And this will give you how many moles of sodium bicarbonate you have. So then once you've done that, you need to calculate your theoretical yield of carbon dioxide in moles. So to do that, you're going to take the moles of sodium bicarbonate from your last step. So this number, I'm trying to change colors here. You're going to plug this in here. 
And if we go back to the previous slide, if we look at our reaction, for every one mole of sodium bicarbonate, we produce one mole of carbon dioxide. So, since this is a one-to-one, -one, it's kind of nice because it makes our life a little bit easier. The number of moles of sodium bicarbonate is also going to be our moles of carbon dioxide. So you can plug that in, and then we have one more step. Actually, we have a couple more steps here. Then we need our theoretical yield of carbon dioxide in grams. So we're going to take our moles of carbon dioxide, and you'll need to calculate the molar mass of carbon dioxide. So for every one mole of carbon dioxide, we need to know how many grams of carbon dioxide, and that's where you plug in your molar mass, and this will give you the grams of carbon dioxide. Now the last step, you need to calculate your percent yield of carbon dioxide. So percent yield is our actual yield divided by our theoretical yield. So your actual yield, you will have calculated back in step 11 from your data table. Your theoretical yield, you calculated in step C, which was the last step we just did. And then you will need to multiply this by 100 to make it a percent. Now you have a couple of discussion questions that you need to answer. Theoretically, we should be able to get 100% yield. But in the lab, we rarely get exactly 100% yield. So you might get less than 100%. So be thinking about as you're doing your experiment, what are some things that can contribute to less than 100% yield? It's also not entirely uncommon in this lab. I always have some students who get more than 100% yield. Now this doesn't mean that you just created matter out of thin air. So be thinking about we know we shouldn't be able to get more than 100% yield. Be thinking about what could cause you to get an artificially high percent yield. And think about those things as you're working through your experiment. So make sure that you have read through your lab handout and submitted your purpose and procedure on Canvas before you come to lab. And I will see you in lab.